this is uh, Rob Furman and my colleague Keith Rees back again. Uh, we've been calling this uh, particular video cast uh, the title Revolution, but we've we've since come up with it with, with a new term that we really like, and we're sort of playing with it to get to get a new uh, a new title for us. Uh, the term is sedition, which which is is a really cool word, um, not one that I heard too often until I had to look it up, but the idea of sedition uh, is, the, the I'm sorry, the definition is conduct or speech inciting people to rebel against the authority. Uh, then it goes on saying of a state or a monarchy or anything like that. But I think that really kind of holds true to, to what Keith and I are trying to do is we want to incite that, that, that rebellion, that, that idea that all because it's been done this way for a really long time doesn't necessarily make it the right way. And that um, ultimately we, we want you to question everything, uh, question us, because that, that makes us grow stronger as well. Um, so, so this conversation uh, that we're going to have right now, uh, we could coin it the great handwriting debate. But generally we're looking at in the 21st century, what are some things that we probably should um, discontinue uh, teaching and spending a lot of time on in the classroom because there's just so much we have to get to. Um, so I'm going to let Keith get started here. Good afternoon, buddy. Good afternoon. Um, I absolutely love this conversation, so I'll just get right to it. Um, I don't see any use for mandating a particular modality of communication, a particular vehicle for communication, um, when so many students are no longer using the implements and the methods that that modality was invented for. We're not using ink and pen to communicate in most of our milieus today. Uh, people who want to communicate information can do so by typing. They can you know, write on a stylus perhaps if they wanted to, but mandating particular style of handwriting seems to me a particularly antiquated idea. Case in point, um, I don't write cursive. And I, I remember vaguely having some lessons on it in elementary school, but it was never my handwriting. I've been a block print writer my whole life. I, my, not even my signature is cursive. So it is useless to me for me to communicate my ideas. The flip side of that is to ingest the information. If I were uh, not immersed in cursive and got to the point where I could not read it, the argument that says, well, without cursive handwriting, we won't be able to read some documents is simply nonsense. We've translated those documents from those old ways of writing into ways of reading and writing that we understand today. It's the same thing as saying, if we don't perpetuate hieroglyphs uh, and use them and teach them in schools, then we won't be able to read anything about the Egyptians. That's a nonsense argument. Of course, we'll be able to. There will be experts in, say, document analysis who may need expertise in styles of cursive, but I don't think that it is a relevant skill for the everyday 21st century learner. And and once again, as always, Keith and I agree on a lot of things. That's why we're friends. But uh, but I am going to attempt to argue this point, even though it, it's hard because I, I totally agree with Keith. Um, but as I've had these conversations, I've had a lot of people uh, throw out different arguments one obviously being the first one you just said um where it's uh it, we don't need to learn the hieroglyphics anymore and, and i and i always say something similar where you know can you can you hear morris code and know what they're saying uh i don't know how, to, I don't know how to i don't know how to uh to set up a horse and buggy because i got a car now you know those things <laughs> so i agree with you but here's here are some of the other debates that i hear uh, signature. I, I, I'll, I'll go there and then and, and I'll hear what you have to say about that. But the one thing we hear a lot is without cursive, how are they supposed to give a formal signature? Well, that's an interesting argument. I've been signing legal documents my whole life and they let me buy a house and they let me go to college and they let me take loans out and they let me sign a contract and I don't use a cursive signature. So I'm not sure that that's a compelling counter argument. Recently heard on NPR um, an interview with banks when they're talking about the signature that you put on your pad. Um, when you go to the checkout 
And, you know, they were talking about how often disease actually get looked at. What does it actually mean? You can draw Mickey Mouse if you want to. If you make your mark, the only reason they have that is to uh, provide a, a form of acknowledgement to the signatory. But it doesn't, the transaction is still valid with or without your signature. There was a time when it was really the only valid way or, or the, the most expedient valid way we could come up with um, ensuring that the veracity of a person's identity was what it was. Um, but we don't do that anymore. Now that's not nearly good enough. If it were, I just would have signed the bottom of my SF-86 when I was applying to work for the F FBI and they just would have taken it. No, they want my fingerprint. They want my retina scan. They want to know it's actually me. But anybody could sign a piece of paper as is evidenced by the fact that some of my kids got pretty good at writing their own hall passes. <laughs> that's very true, very true. So, so how about that in terms of cursive itself, uh, in terms of uh, it being something artistic, I was actually considering talking to my art teacher about putting a uh, a portion of the art classes being calligraphy slash handwriting. It's really one and the same, and I thought that'd be a kind of an interesting place to sort of save that that artistic type of experience. Your thoughts? I think that's extraordinarily valid, and I think that it. I mean, it. it I want to learn. I used to want to be a calligrapher. I did a little calligraphy. I love the pens. I just think they're marvelous. And um, I create a kind of art that's called asemics, which involves um, symbols and things that kind of look like handwriting that don't really have any specific connotation. It's a good skill. I think that it's a valid thing to put in an art curriculum, in an art history curriculum, very specifically. We could really drill down into understanding those things. And maybe even one could make the argument that in some portion of social studies, learning, reading historical documents for people who are at advanced levels for whom that is relevant, I think that's marvelous. And I'm not saying we don't expose kids. So that's actually, I think, a pretty compelling counter argument for keeping it in the curriculum someplace, but someplace relevant, and I have a difficult time, and I think you and I are very much on the same page on this, mandating things that don't apply to everyone for everyone. Some people may need that, but I don't think that everyone needs uh, to know how to create and consume cursive. Right, and I think that's very much the challenge that we face as educators, is the idea of that personalized education. But that's where we have to be with everything, mm -hmm. not just this, but with everything, that's where we have to be. Um, uh, here's here's one argument that I've heard that that is, I guess you could say a little compelling, but at the same time, there's a lot of ways to debate it. So let's hear what you have to say. Uh, okay. Fine motor skills. Uh, we do know that in the early ages, K one two, that that not only are they be teaching them to print, but they're gaining that fine motor skill strength in their fingers. What are your thoughts? I don't have a problem with that. That is, I do think that's a compelling argument. And I think that if you were to show me, now granted, I must always caveat these things. I don't have any empirical studies in front of me and I would want to see them before I make policy, but I don't think that either one of us disagrees on that. Um, I can appreciate the possibility that that might be a very effective way of teaching fine motor skills. And I don't think that don't write at all, do not learn how to create symbols of any kind to specifically communicate meaning is necessarily a valid position. I think even I would be hard pressed, even as a hardcore anti-traditionalist, as a seditionist, if you will. I think even I would be pushed hard to say, let's not do writing of any kind, but it's the specific argument that cursive needs to be an element. If, if I can print and communicate effectively in block writing, and that gets me the fine motor benefit, then I have a difficult time mandating the other. Were I to see a study that made a compelling case that cursive handwriting really is the ideal vehicle for developing those skills, that might uh, make a little hay with me, but it's gonna take something like that. Right, right, and, and I, I agree with you, obviously. Um, uh, how about we, we go on, because my, my the one person I just spoke with in regards to this was interesting because they said, um, how do you do something like that without getting everyone involved? And, and that to me is, is, is a, also a really good argument because yeah, it, you would have to make sure everybody um, would agree upon uh, the make your mark signature or the ability to you know where would be a good place for this. You'd certainly want to have some, some buy-in from banks and businesses and companies like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so taking it one step further, um, moving away from handwriting a little bit, but in, in similar concept, you know, what do we do with things like uh, spelling? Uh, you, I'm sure you've seen the paragraph where you, they just give you the first and last letter of the, of the word and everything in between is jumbled and you can still read it. Um, sure. Obviously, spell check on the computer is a regular thing now. Um, so how about things like uh, spelling? What are your thoughts? 
Well, I, I think this does get a little bit. Um, We're having a little bit of a hard time with your with your video right now, Keith. You want to take a look at that? Oh, that's weird. I see it. Let me toggle. Hang on. There you go. Okay, you could talk now. I at least see your face. There we go. Now we're getting someplace. <laughs> we're, we're getting somewhere. There you go. There we go. Um, spelling. Well, I think spelling and grammar probably have to go in the same bin for this particular conversation. If the objective of language is, let me, let me go one step back from this to a conversation I had yesterday, funny the, the way things work. Um, I often hear it heard as a musician, people would say, music is the universal language. No, it's not. It, that's nonsense. Um, Language communicates specific meaning. That's the whole reason we have language. Um, I think there's a case to be made that it, maybe the first symbols that people created were not for that intent. They, you can make the case that the first symbols were art and not language. You, you could make a conversational argument about that. I think you could make a compelling argument that this, the first symbol that was intended to be language may have been closer to poetry than to sentence. Okay, I, I can buy that. That notwithstanding. Um, if we desire the ability to communicate specific meaning and to be understood genuinely, authentically, and, and in a real sense, which I think that's a natural, innate desire of humans. I think that's probably why we evolve language. If that's the case, then specific spelling and grammar study, syntax study, the, the construction and understanding of the mechanics of language in any given language would seem to be extraordinarily important. I go one step further than that. The younger we can do that to relate that in a multilingual way to other languages will further help us communicate and receive specific intent from people who may not have the same language and structure that we do. Um, that having been said, it, are you cap or, or is it possible to navigate your life being a crappy speller? Clearly it is. We meet <laughs> those people all the time. But I do think that the school has a compelling interest in helping to, and again, here's where I come from, empower the learner to really communicate in a way that is genuine to that person's intent. I think empowering a person with language empowers them, and that's a very valid concern for us. Excellent. Okay, I got one more for you, Keith. And, and this one's the one that always sort of really gets me uh, wound up and excited. Um, you know, as a futurist, and, and I'm, I'm a member of the World Future Society, so a lot of times the conversations that I have with those guys, we're talking 20, 30 years in the future. I will be well retired before the things that, that they're talking about ever come to fruition. But nonetheless, it is interesting because we, we're setting the groundworks. You know, we're, we're the pioneers of education right now. When they write about us, us in the history books, it's going to be like, look, look what these people did with this wild and crazy technology that they never heard of or had before. So I find it very <laughs> exciting. Anyways, what about the need or lack thereof to, even, to go so far as to even say, we don't really need to teach kids how to type anymore. So now we're talking about <laughs> writing, printing, and typing. And here's why I say that. Right now, as I'm sitting here at my desk, I can talk to Alexa, who's my Amazon Echo, and get music played for me. I can get facts and figures told to me through the air. You name it. Um, I've got Dragon naturally speaking on my computer, so I don't even really have to touch a mouse anymore, and I can open up documents, I can write documents, all with my voice. Yes, that may be turning us into lazy, but it is doable right now. But what futurists are saying is 20 or 30 years from now, we may not need any of that. What are your thoughts? You know, my colleague Kathy Gust and I have had this conversation, and I know that when she sees this, she's going to be annoyed that I'm going to take this position. But <laughs> I would be of the opinion, I would share, I think, Kurzweil's and other futurists' opinions that um, those technologies were intermediary steps on our way to becoming more facile in getting what's in our heads out into the world, and that the keyboard is a kind of ineffective way of doing that. I never learned how to type, and I can, I mean, as I just sent you a text that I can type pretty darn fast. <laughs> I, I have a pretty high typing rate with low errors. I never learned home row. I don't, I don't do that, right? Same. I think that um, that typing method presupposes certain things about a person's, first of all, physiology. Um, what about students that don't have um, typically shape, typically size, typically functional uh, hands and fingers in the same way. I, I really get concerned about leaving individuals out when we homogenize. I, I hate homogenization. Um, but 
Further than that, I dictated huge portions of the rough draft of my book using Dragon Naturally Speaking. I, I think it's a, it's a terrific specific product because its accuracy is really pretty good. Um, I, I have a difficult time saying, no, you ha it's better for you to use this method that works for a lot of other people. I, I'm me. I don't want you to tell me what works for other people. I want you to tell me what works for me. So I have a difficult time perpetuating teaching typing uh, maybe exposing students to different methods is valid. I can buy that. But if a student can communicate 130 words per minute, do I care if they're using a flamingo method and poking with their nose on the keyboard? No, I don't. I don't care how. Just do it. Our obsession with process and method is a hindrance to progressive pedagogy, I think. Excellent. And once again, a, a wonderful conversation with you, Keith. Um, I, I'm hoping that we can get some people to uh, to debate this a little bit. Uh, I did write an article about this in, in the Huffington Post and under my blog, and it really got some, uh, some some generated some interesting conversation because I think it's a, it's a very passionate one um, because there's just so many possibilities, and it's one of those things where it's just hard to think about the future sometimes and not get a little apprehension and I get that but um, but nonetheless it, it's, it's happening it's coming and we need to make some uh, hard decisions on some of these these type of topics and I think Keith and I would be in agreement in saying that as long as you're thinking about the individual child you, you really you'll really never go wrong in your decision it's when all of these outside uh, influences come into play and, and or you're trying to make a one size fits all that's where you really get into the problems so you know at the end of the day teachers parents administrators you know if, if you're thinking about what can i do to help the individual child you're, you're, you're not going to go wrong in anything you decide so that's uh the seditionists we will try that title for today see how that feels um <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll be talking to you soon thank you very much